Thank you. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, again, I'm Chris Brown. Uh, just happy to be here. This is my first Def Conf. I also wanted to say I'm part of the Diversity Scholarship Program, so glad to have that program here. I'm thankful to be a part of that. Um, the conference has been going well so far. All right, so first, a little bit about me. Um, I did my undergrad in computer science at Duke University. I graduated 2013. And then 2015, I went to NC State to start a PhD in computer science. Uh, currently heading into my fifth year, so hopefully finishing up uh, pretty soon. Um, apart from school, uh, for professional experience, um, after I finished undergrad, I spent two years as a Python developer at Bank of America. I'm just working on back-end and front-end stuff for them. Um, and then since then, I've had two internships, uh, one summer as a software engineering intern at BlackBot, and I spent two summers as a quality engineering intern at Red Hat, uh, working for a satellite. All right, um, so if you haven't seen the movie, sorry to bother you. Um, this is the main character, Cass Green, or Cassius, or Cash. Um, in the movie, um, he's kind of down on his luck, but he gets the job as a telemarketer. Um, and at first, it's kind of hard for him to adjust because he's always like calling people and they're like hanging up on him or ignoring him or cussing him out or whatever. Um, and so we're kind of just using this as our metaphor that making recommendations is hard. Um, so a lot of people here have tools they want to recommend, tools and projects they're working on. Uh, people here are also looking for tools to use for their projects. What's the best way to say, hey, you should use my project? All right, um, so that was a brief introduction. Um, now I'll just go into a quick overview of my research. Uh, just kind of share things we've tried that work, things we've tried that don't work. Uh, what I'm currently looking at, and then the future of recommendations um, in terms of what I'm looking at specifically for my work. All right, so the overall goal of my research is to improve software engineer behavior and productivity, uh, specifically looking at development tool adoption. So there are all of these tools out there, static analysis tools, security tools, uh, continuous integration tools that are built, built to help developers complete tasks, so like making you better at your work, essentially. Uh, the problem is developers don't use these tools. Um, so one of the things I'm trying to look at is how can we encourage developers to first discover these tools and then actually use the tools once they figure out what they are. Um, so Greg Wilson, um, he's a big name in the software engineering research community. Um, he tweeted out, I think the most interesting topic for software engineering research in the next 10 years is how do we get working programmers to actually adopt better practices. Um, so one of the other things I'm interested in is how do we actually get people to adopt practices and tools that the research community comes up with. Um, so being previously in industry and now in academia, I see like people in research are coming up with all these cool processes and ideas. Uh, but in reality, software developers don't care. They just want to get their stuff done. Um, so one of the things I want to get into is how can we actually bridge that gap so people in industry can kind of see what's going on in research, and then people in research actually care about, or people in industry, or yeah, people in research care about what the industry people want. Um, so there will be a little opportunity at the end to participate in the research if you would like. Uh, but just a quick survey once this talk is over. All right, so we've tried a few things to see what does and doesn't work, uh, what do developers like and don't like. Uh, the first thing we found developers don't like are emails. Um, so for our methodology, this is just kind of explaining what we did. Uh, we were recommending Black, which is an automatic Python formatting tool. Um, it's an open source tool. People can contribute and use it however they want. Uh, we looked at Python projects on GitHub, and we use the Google Cloud Platform to basically search through GitHub commits looking for the string pep8 or flake8. So we're essentially looking for developers on GitHub who contribute to projects and they commit a fix for a Python formatting error. Um, based on that, then we send an email like, hey, we saw you manually fix this error. If you use this tool black, you can automatically fix it and not have to worry about fixing it yourself. 
Um, then we also had like a quick survey to kind of see what people think about what the recommendations said, how likely they'd be to try the tool, different things like that. Uh, we found emails were not good. Um, so for our results, we sent out 100 emails, um, only five people responded. So it's like a 5% response rate. Um, there are also two not so great responses, um, not included in those five, uh, which we'll get in right now. Um, so the first, the guy that created Black actually sent me an email saying, hey, uh, please stop sending these emails uh, recommending my tool. Um, so basically he's like, I received a few questions about the automatic form you were sending in response to the cold quality setup activity on GitHub. In at least one case, the recipient treated your automatic message as spam, and in all cases it was perceived as a rather aggressive form of advertising. Uh, Unsolicited messaging like the one you're sending out has negative connotations. This can in turn negative in negatively impact my project. So basically we found that people hate emails so bad that they wouldn't respond to our emails, but they'd email him to say, hey, can you get these people to stop sending emails automatically recommending your tools? Um, the second one is from a guy in Europe. So there's the general data protection regulation law. So in Europe, basically, you also can't spam people with emails. Um, this guy is saying, hey, the way you're using my contact is not compliant with this law. I have not consented to receive this email. Um, there's no legal basis for you to be contacting me. Um, so these are just two examples kind of showing that people really hate emails. Um, so if you have something you want to do or something you want to recommend, um, email is not the way to go. So basically the second thing we tried is what if we made automatic pull requests on GitHub projects. Um, so this is just another way, so emails don't work. What if we actually move from email to the actual projects developers are working on? Um, so what we did for this is we are recommending error prone. It's a, a Java static analysis tool uh, built by Google. Um, it's not only open source and that you can contribute to the code but you can also contribute your own bug patterns if you want to check for different things that aren't really caught by Java compilers or something specific to your own project. Um, so like hundreds of different bugs you can check for uh, uh, that are different from like a normal check styles or any other static analysis tool. So for this, uh, we're targeting Java projects on GitHub. Um, we looked at projects with Maven and what we did was we created a bot to automatically update the pom.xml file for Java projects and add the error prone plugin to this tool or to the project and then saying, hey, here's a project, we found some errors, you can fix this by adopting this tool and prevent future errors in your code. Um, and then the pull request is basically what we sent. So we're saying, hey, here's this tool. We're automatically adding it to the project for you so you don't have to do it yourself. Try to merge this pull request and it'll make your project better. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, basically, this is just saying, hey, you're not using any error pro checking in your build. Um, here's an example error that this tool can find. If you want to try the tool, just merge the project. Um, and so we actually just, this is what we edited. We pretty much just added the error prone plugin to people's projects saying, hey, this will automatically run when you build. If you just compile it, error prone will automatically do the work for you so you don't have to do it yourself. Um, we also found developers didn't really like this. Um, so we sent out 52 pull requests, uh, just to random projects with Maven on GitHub. Only two people merged the project or merged the pull request. Uh, we also kind of gathered feedback to try to figure out why people did or did not like these recommendations. Um, so the two people that did merge it, one actually eventually reverted back later saying, oops, this is actually causing a bunch of errors. We don't really want this. Uh, but we still say it was successful because they at least tried the tool, figured out they didn't like it, and then they're like, okay, we're going back. So there were two main reasons people didn't like the automated pull requests. Um, the first is just social context. Um, so one kind of the main one of the main themes we got from feedback was people didn't like how we were kind of just barging in and changing things on the project. Um, so this guy he complained that we deleted his prof release profile, which is part of the XML, part of the Maven build, 
Um, he closes the pull request, then he realizes we didn't actually delete it, but we just kind of messed up the format for the whole file. Um, so developers are very picky about formatting tabs and spaces and making sure everything's aligned properly. Our tool did not really care about that. We just kind of added it and then set the pull request. Uh, but people do not like when you kind of mess things up in terms of format. Um, we also received a lot of these. So when you contribute to open source software, a lot of projects say, hey, you need to read the contributing guidelines. Can you sign this agreement? Our bot does not actually do that. We just kind of do pull requests at random. And so we also received a lot of comments saying, hey, we can't accept this change because you actually haven't agreed to the rules of this project. The second big issue with our bot was that it was interrupting developer workflow. Um, so a lot of people complained like, hey, you know, the change looks good, but it's causing a bunch of errors. Um, we failed a lot of Travis CI builds, as you can see if you use Travis CI. And the thing is, like, most of these are actually from the tool kind of saying, hey, these are errors in your code, but people still don't want to have to go check out what errors these are that the tool is reporting, see if it's worth fixing or not. Um, and that kind of also pissed a lot of people off. All right, so we have this problem. Um, automated recommendations are not good, pretty much. Um, people view them as disruptive. Uh, they're intrusive. You know, I don't want people intruding on my projects. How can I actually recommend things in an effective way? Um, so PryWork also supports this idea that bot-human interactions are very bad. Um, Wessel, um, he did a study in 2018 looking at the power of, open s power of bots in open source software. Um, he found that developers really like bots if they do things for them, so like automating tasks, analyzing code, bots are great, but developers actually hate interacting with bots. So in terms of like chat bots or bots like these recommendations, developers really do not like those at all. Um, this is just a plug for one of my colleagues. Um, if you do have a project, he's trying to put up this bots.yaml. So if you don't actually want bots to get onto your project, um, there's kind of a new format he's trying to start, where if you add a bots.yaml file, say, hey, I do not want any bots to contact me by email, pull requests, whatever, um, then yeah, you should add this file. And then we're trying to get also the bot creators to try to kind of put their projects onto this format so they say, hey, this project has this file, I'm not going to touch it. So, what kind of things do work in terms of making recommendations to developers? Um, the thing that research shows actually works is peer interactions. Um, so, uh, this is work by my previous advisor. Um, he found that peer interactions are the most effective way developers learn about new tools. Um, so, that peer interaction, again, is the process of discovering tools from coworkers during your work activity. So, whether that's your pair programming work with another developer or another developer just says, hey, here, try this tool. You see another developer use a tool and you want to say, hey, what's that? All of these are examples of like peer interaction, face-to-face, in-person contact with another person saying, hey, you're using this tool, I want to use it too. Uh, so what he did for this study was he looked at various ways people uh, learn about tools, um, interviewed and surveyed a bunch of software developers. I'm looking at like social media, um, RSS feeds, tutorials, documentation, uh, discussion threads on chats, and then people just randomly finding a tool while perusing the internet. Um, and out of all of these kind of ways people discover tools, he found that peer interactions are the most effective. So we did a study to figure out why. So what makes peer interactions or interactions with humans so effective for recommending tools to software engineers? Um, so for this study, uh, we had pairs of participants working on Kaggle data science competition. Um, so they have like a list of competition every year. We had them complete tasks for the Titanic data set. Uh, we had 13 pairs of participants. Um, it was a mix of student groups as well as professionals. Uh, we said here are the tasks. You can use any tool you want. So whatever tool you think will help complete this task, you can use it with your partner to complete this project. Uh, we recorded each session to try to figure out what tools were recommended between partners and kind of see like which ones were effective, which ones weren't so good, 
uh, and how people react to receiving a recommendation. Um, this was presented at the Visual Languages and Human Centric Computing Conference a few years back. So we looked at five different kind of characteristics of kind of suggestions between peers to kind of see what makes a recommendation effective. Um, psychology research says the first four things impact how humans make decisions without considering tools or recommendations. So if you're polite, people are more likely to do what you say, for instance. So if people make recommendations for tools to each other, are they actually being polite and is that what makes them effective? Uh, for tool observability, we just kind of looked at do the tools have a user interface or if they're just like a command line tool or keyboard shortcut where you can actually see what the tool is doing. So we actually had some success in terms of like peer interactions, looking at how peers recommend tools to each other. Uh, we saw a total of 142 tools recommended, uh, which is 50%. So we went from like 5% on emails and pull requests to now 50% of people actually accept a tool recommended by another peer. Um, so uh, we have this big fancy table here, which just shows a bunch of statistics stuff. The important thing to note is that receptiveness is the only one that was statistically significant, which basically means the outcome of an interaction or a recommendation is directly dependent on receptiveness. So politeness, persuasiveness, time pressure, they're all important, but really don't matter if you want somebody to actually take a, or like take a chance to look at your tool. So, uh, what do we actually mean by receptiveness? Um, this is by Fogg, who looked at creating persuasive technology. Um, he defines receptiveness as demonstrating a desire and familiarity. Um, so, just two quick examples. In our study, two people were working on a task. Um, somebody said, hey, you can use add level to add a, to a pivot table in Excel. Um, and the participant responded, oh, add level, yes, awesome. So, here we see that L14, who was a professional analyst, number 14, um, they were actually demonstrating a desire to use this tool to add a level to a table in Excel, and then they used it for the rest of the participate or the rest of the study, I guess. Um, on the flip side, familiarity um, on another group, who, two students, uh, one guy was like, "Hey, we can do this in R. It's pretty easy. I know how to do it." Um, the partner says, I don't know R, and then they never use R for the rest of the study. So this kind of shows how people who aren't familiar with a tool are not going to use it because they don't know how to use it. They don't know, I guess, the kind of ins and outs of the tool. It may seem very foreign to them. So you want to make sure that people are actually kind of familiar and know what's going on with the tool you're trying to recommend. All right, so there are a few problems in terms of peer interactions. Uh, one is scalability. So we just showed that you know human interactions are the best way for people to learn about new tools. Well, if I have a tool, I can't go to every person on Earth to say, hey, you should use this tool. Um, so basically, how do we actually scale this to the millions of developers around the world who could benefit from using our product? Um, the issue with receptiveness is that out of all the characteristics we looked at, um, receptiveness is the only thing that we actually can't control. So you can make the most polite recommendations, just pretty please. You can have the coolest tool. You can have the most persuasive argument for why this tool is better than all the other tools. But if a user is not receptive to using the tool, then they're not going to use it. So this is kind of difficult in terms of making recommendations. We can't actually control how receptive people are to our recommendations. And then the biggest problem, uh, which was also reported in the same paper as before, is that peer interaction is the most effective mode of tool discovery, but it's also the most infrequent. So we see that the face-to-face -face interactions between developers are actually declining, and we see that peer interactions are, even though they're effective, they rarely happen in the workplace. All right, so uh, Sherry Tarkle, she wrote this book called Alone Together, which basically talks about how technology is kind of causing us to ruin, or is, I don't know, it's like really declining the face-to-face -face interactions between people. So a lot of times, rather than meet with people, we'd rather talk on the phone. Um, instead of talking to people on the phone, we'd rather text. So really, face-to-face -face communication in general in our society 
is kind of going downhill because of technology. Um, and we also see this is true in software engineering. So basically there was a study uh, of Microsoft developers looking at open uh, collaboration spaces. Um, so open workspaces were kind of made to like increase productivity, communication, you know, increase collaboration between developers. Um, this survey showed that only like 20% of people actually think open workspaces are beneficial to a coding environment. Um, and other studies also show that open workspaces, open workspaces actually decrease productivity for developers and just workers, employees in general. Um, and then there's this idea of global software engineering. So not only are developers not working together even in the same office, but we have developers all over the world contributing to the same project. Um, so when I was an intern at Red Hat, we had our team in Raleigh. Uh, we were working with developers in Brazil, um, in Brno's Czech Republic, uh, people in India. So we're all around the world trying to work on the same project. So of course, in that instance, it's hard to actually say, hey, you should use this tool face-to-face -face if people across the world are actually working on the same project with me. So uh, what does that mean in terms of how do we get people to adopt our tools and our products? Um, it's kind of like we're all alone as developers. We don't want to talk to anybody. How can we actually effectively make recommendations to other people? And so the solution uh, that we're trying in our work is called nudge theory. Um, so this is a behavioral science concept uh, made popular by Thaler and Sunstein. Basically, a nudge is anything that impacts human decision making that doesn't offer incentives and doesn't ban alternatives. Um, so a very popular example is the layout of a grocery store. So if you walk into a grocery store, research shows the first thing you see is most likely what you're going to get. So if you walk in and see chips, you're more likely to buy chips. Whereas if you walk in and see a bunch of fruits and vegetables, you're actually more likely to buy fruits and vegetables. So the people of nudge theory would say, as a grocery store owner or designer, you should put fruits and vegetables up front to encourage people to eat healthier and make better decisions. Um, we're not kind of we're not providing incentives to get fruits and vegetables, so you don't get extra money or anything. Um, we also aren't banning you from going to the chips aisle to buy chips and junk food, but just by the way things are arranged in the location, it can actually significantly impact what you're going to get. Um, so furthermore, um, Weinman and colleagues they argue that as more and more decisions are being made online um, in digital choice environments. This concept of digital nudging is becoming more and more important. So using technology to create nudges for people to change their behavior. Um, so the popular example is like a Fitbit smartwatch. Um, basically it's a watch kind of tracks your activities. Um, using these watches and things like that can help you uh, get, be more active, choose healthier decisions just based on what the watch is saying, not by any other means of forcing you to eat, eat healthier or be more active or anything like that. So uh, for my research, I'm trying to investigate process appropriate digital nudges. Um, this is just the concept of integrating things from nudge theory, what research without nudge theory says about making recommendations to humans, and actually applying it to developer workflows. So integrating these into how developers make decisions on things they use and different tools and stuff like that. So uh, what I've been working on this summer is kind of the start of this project and then I'll show the future work what we plan to do later. Uh, we're looking at the suggested changes feature on GitHub. Um, it's a new public beta feature uh, introduced October uh, 2018. Uh, basically, it allows developers to go to a pull request, say, hey, um, I see this issue here. I suggest you change it to this line, which is an improvement. Um, and so then you can either commit directly or ignore it or do whatever. Uh, basically, what we're trying to see is that this is an example of a nudge. Um, you can commit the suggestion, but you aren't really forced to commit it. You can kind of leave it if you want. Um, there's also no incentive to commit this suggestion, but it's one way that people online can kind of peer, make peer recommendations to each other saying, hey, here's an issue in your code, try using this line, 
and then having people who made the change or received the suggested change kind of decide for themselves, are you willing to accept it or not? So this study is divided up into three parts. Um, the, first page, the first part is just comparing how this, this new feature compares to pull requests and issues. I'm just looking at in terms of how much people accept it, um, how quickly do people accept recommendations from suggested changes compared to pull requests and issues and different things like that. Uh, for phase two, we sent out an email to a bunch of developers um, just saying that or so developers who either used the tool to make a suggestion or received a suggestion just to see like how useful do you find this tool, does it fit in your workflow and things like that. And then the final phase we wanted to see is this tool actually useful for recommending static analysis tools to developers. Um, so we made tool recommendations and compared using emails, issues, pull requests, and the suggested changes feature to kind of see which ones do developers actually like in terms of receiving a pull request from a user. And we plan to present this at the, well, submit, uh, this mission is next week, submit to the International Conference of Software Engineering. So for the first phase, um, we found that pull requests are still the most popular way to make suggestions on GitHub. Um, as far as people saying, hey, here's a change you should add to your repository, and then the developer saying, okay, I'm going to add this change. Um, suggested changes are close, but not quite on the same level. Uh, we did find, however, that pull requests with suggestions are way or significantly more effective than pull requests without the suggested changes feature. And we also found that suggestions are accepted about twice as fast as pull requests. So even though people may not accept them as much, people can make a decision on if they're going to accept it or not much faster than a pull request or an issue. Um, and again, all of the red rectangles are statistically significant. So we basically ran some fancy stats tests and it says, hey, this is significant in terms of getting people to actually make suggestions and accept recommendations. In our survey to developers, uh, we found that they saw this tool is very useful in terms of like integrating it into their workflow and for teams. Um, towards the left is the more useful, so more useful people are to the left and the people who say it's not useful to the right. Um, nobody said it's not at all useful. Uh, most people say it's useful, not very useful, but just useful. Um, there are still some issues with the feature itself, so a lot of people we surveyed uh, really complain about not being able to suggest changes to multiple lines or to be able to commit in a batch commit so a lot of people don't like each suggestion itself is one single commit so if you have a bunch then you are like really extending the commit for this one pull request and they would rather see it all combined into one. Um, on, as a side note for this, um, another way to show that emails are bad is we sent about 300 emails to people and only got responses from about 50, which is like 6%. So again, don't use emails to send surveys or recommend tools. And then finally for phase three, we had developers look at each of these kind of mock recommendations for a tool um, using a suggested change pull request issue or an email. Um, and again, we found that suggestions were the most popular. So the preferred way to kind of make recommendations to developers uh, based on looking at different examples for each of these systems. All right, so moving forward, uh, kind of what I'm trying to look at for my future work is how do we actually implement this suggested change recommendation system to real life or to actual developers on GitHub. Um, so if you remember um, from our earlier, kind of the earlier slides, the kind of four issues we kind of ran into were interrupting developer workflow and social context when we like automatically submitted pull requests. Uh, in terms of like what actually receptiveness is, we looked at familiarity and desire. How can we target developers' familiarity and target the things that they want to desire or the things they desire in terms of tool recommendations. And we plan to come up with this. Um, so this is 
a bot that automatically suggests tools on pull requests saying, hey, um, here's a tool that can help you fix and find errors in your code. Um, so to target desire, we try to say, hey, developers don't want bugs in their code, so you don't want errors, this tool can actually fix all these errors. So we kind of emphasize the fixing errors part of your code, which research shows debugging is the most time-consuming part of software engineering and the least favorite part of developers. For familiarity, we just try to emphasize, hey, this is your code. Um, you made this change at the top. This is your project you contribute to, so you're actually familiar with this area in the code. And uh, without trying to be mean about it, saying you added this error to this project. Uh, for social context, uh, just adding different information about the tool. Um, so kind of the error itself um, links to other places in the code where the same error appears. Uh, we have a link to the website down here, uh, like fixing the spacing issues from before. So all of these are just kind of like providing more information about the tool itself and the things that um, developers kind of want when they see a recommendation or want a suggested change for a tool. And then finally for the developer workflow, uh, we kind of like make the recommendation on the exact line of code that has the error. Uh, we actually provide a fix, uh, which is one thing that uh, in the pull request study people complained about all these errors being reported. Um, so here we say, hey, this tool suggests this fix for this project or for this error. And then at the bottom there's a commit suggestion. So the developers actually have the power to decide whether they want to commit this or hold off. Whereas for pull requests, it's automatically built into the continuous integration or build system and they automatically run and cause a bunch of things to fail. So in this case, they kind of get to choose whether or not they have the power to choose if they want to try it or not. All right, um, so just to kind of wrap things up, just what does this mean for DevConf? Uh, we're all here. Uh, a lot of people are here kind of, you know, recommending tools. Um, just a quick glance through the website and the schedule, and we see that all of these tools are being recommended here at this conference. Um, and this is just looking at the titles of talks, not actually the talks themselves. So if you're a developer, you can see this list and be like, well, it's kind of overwhelming. I don't know which tools to go to. I go to talks and then I don't know which, how this tool and the talk will actually apply to what I'm trying to do. And it could kind of be like, a, I don't know, kind of like a sea of tools in terms of developers. Um, so just some things to consider. Uh, we found that the most effective way to recommend tools is from peer interactions. Uh, unfortunately, that's not very scalable or appropriate for how software engineering is built today. Um, so if you are a tool developer or a tool enthusiast and you want to get your tool out there, uh, the first thing we would say is to try to target receptiveness. Um, again, looking at the desire and familiarity of programmers. So how does this actually fit into developers' desire in terms of improving their project? What is the goal of your tool and how can it fit into a workflow for a developer? Um, how is this tool familiar to developers? So is it similar to other tools? Does it complete the similar workflow that developers already do? What's the best way to actually kind of show them that you're already familiar with this technology? Just use this tool and we can do it for you. Uh, social context, um, developers don't like outsiders or intruders kind of invading into their project without being part of the community, part of the ecosystem of the project. Um, so without trying to like barge in by sending emails or pull requests, you can kind of say like, hey, we're this project, we just kind of want to integrate in safely and smoothly without causing any issues. Um, and then finally, the user workflow. So if you target users, the last thing you want to do is kind of interrupt their workflow and kind of like make them have to do more work. Um, so in terms of integrating into the workflow, finding ways to effectively integrate your tool into the workflow of a developer so that it makes it as easy as possible for them to kind of accept the tool that you're trying to recommend. And if you can do these things, then everybody will be happy. All right. Thanks for your time, and sorry for bothering you. The mic.
I'm going to pass the mic. Sorry. So one of the things that can happen when you're doing automated uh, requests in any sort of environment like GitHub is that sometimes the bot can be over aggressive, especially on a busy uh, community with a lot of pull requests. So one of the things that uh, I was wondering if you'd consider would be some way of having uh, a project to be able to opt out their entire project because they may not want to see 300, 3,000 of these automated requests coming in to them that could really sour perception and on an active community that could really impact perception of the tooling in a more broader sense. Wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Martin Monpress, he's trying to uh, get this um, Bots.yaml, right? Yeah, bots.yaml. So there's a kind of movement going on from the uh, bots and software engineering workshop, uh, which was over the summer, basically saying, hey, a lot of people on GitHub don't really like bots and don't want bots on their project. So he's looking at adding a bots.yaml file. So if you're a developer of a project and you have this file, you can say, hey, we don't want any bots, or you can say, hey, we only want pull request bots and not email bots or if we kind of you kind of control the power of the bot interactions I guess and then for bot designers we're trying to get it so that if you see this file kind of adhere to what the project wants so if they say no bots then no bots if they say okay only pull requests then just kind of say okay we're only make pull requests and things like that but I can, uh, there is a link, I can send it to you later if you're interested in that. Uh, regarding the peer-to-peer -peer interactions, so you suggested a study you did with the Kaggle data set. So that was a face-to-face -face interaction, right, where you actually recommend tools. So what about virtual interactions where we can recommend tools via blog posts or via LinkedIn a post or requests of that sort? Does that fall under the peer-to-peer -peer interaction category as well? Uh, that does not. Um, in the study by Murphy Hill, who's my old advisor, he looked at those separately. So saying, like, if a tool is recommended even if it's by a peer but through a virtual interface so like Twitter for example he looked at people say Twitter is good for learning about tools but it's still not as effective as effective as like a face-to-face -face interaction um, so I think kind of we showed that human peer interactions are on the decline especially in software engineering so I think recommendations like those would become more important actually so I think that was um, 2011 when he did that study so I think now we kind of see things start to converge eventually I think most people will start getting tools from social media or blogs as opposed to from other peers and so in that case I think that would be important to try to improve those recommendations sorry any other questions I don't know if you called I didn't hear that I don't know Sorry. Um, I, if anyone, if no one else has a question right now, I'd like to ask a question. Um, so, uh, you talked about how there's a good amount of research to show that um, people don't, or developers particularly, don't like interacting with bots in a kind of social way. Um, is do, do you feel, at least like anecdotally, not necessarily statistically, that you have like kind of a uh, something that provides you some amount of hope in making people like feel more positively about interacting with a bot that, that's making pull requests or something. Um, so, yeah, the first the the pull request study showed people don't like bots. Other research shows that. I think by trying this design in the middle, we're hopeful that it can improve how people interact with bots. Um, so, using this type of bot is not as intrusive as say like hey, you must do this, it's kind of just like a comment, hey, you know, we saw this error, this tool can find and fix errors like that. Um, so rather than being like super spammy, we also haven't figured out the frequency, so like of course if we run a tool on a project and there are like 100 errors, we don't want 100 of these coming up on somebody's pull request. So kind of targeting when, the, when to recommend using this type of system and what's the best tool or like what's the best 
bot or error to target. So like if you target errors developers don't really care about, then they're not going to really care about the tool. But if there's like a more important error or something that's higher priority, they may try to look at that as well. Um, so those are some of the things we're still kind of looking into. All right. Um, one last call? Okay. Well, I guess it's sort of the opposite side of that question as well, which is that there's obviously a history of bots that people really feel positively towards, like the whole Karma bots and the and all the, all the Python bots that PyBot builds out, the Soupy bot and stuff that let you do things from IRC and so on. So that line of it being some, I mean, you mentioned that before about it being something that, you know, things that can do for you. So um, I, I don't know exactly how to frame that as a question, but what do you, like, is there, are, can you create this into, can you move this into some kind of methodology so that if I came along with any kind of thing I wanted to sort of recommend into people, I could find a way to rethink it and reframe it so that it could come out the other side like this and not spam people with 200 annoying messages? Right. Um, so, yeah. Most of my work is on tool recommendations. Um, so this kind of thing is recommended for tools. One of the other things I'm interested in is how do we actually recommend uh, processes or practices? So things like code reviews or testing, things like that. How do we say, hey, we noticed you aren't really doing this in your project. Can we recommend this you to try this out? Um, so I think, again, uh, the, the Wessel study showed that people like bots doing things for them but don't like doing things with bots. Um, so improving that interaction is probably the priority. And then actually just kind of saying like, hey, these things are actually important. So like, again, the receptiveness thing, if they think it's important, they're more likely to have a like desire to try it. Or if it's like, hey, you do this all the time. Um, so like the Python black tool, for example, like, hey, you, al you, always, auto or you always manually fix this in other people's pull requests. If you use this tool, we can automatically format it for you so you don't have to keep doing that. And then you can spend time on cooler projects and other things. Okay, uh, I think we're just about at time. Thank you. Um, this was great. <laughs> so I, I'd like to, I'd like us all to thank our speaker. Um, I think we have a short afternoon break. And then there's going to be um, kind of a final um, end of conference event in Metcalf Hall, I believe. Oh, also, um, there's a survey here if you'd like just to provide feedback or anything about the talk. Just a few questions. So uh, this talk is to participate in the research. Otherwise, thanks yep. for the time.